Hello everyone, welcome to today's international webinar. This event is about to begin soon. So before I start, I would like to inform you that all the participants have to turn on the video during this event. Everyone is requested to keep your microphone muted during the webinar session. During the, during the presentation by speakers, if you have questions, please write down in the link provided by the committee. The link is also will be sent through the chat box. All the participants are encouraged to follow our YouTube channel. Certificate and attendance from form will be sent later both in Zoom and YouTube application. And you only need to fill it once. This event is part of webinar series held by Water Resources Engineering Department Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya, in collaboration with Ministry of Public Works and Housing, Republic of Indonesia, ISC Delft, Netherlands, and Jasa Tertawan Public Corporation. This event is also part of celebration on the 57th anniversary of Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya, and also the 44th anniversary of Water Resources Engineering Department. From the list of the participants, we have recorded more than 800 registered participants from all around the world. People of more than 20 countries have joined this webinar. We have participants from Malaysia, Ghana, Japan, Germany, Netherlands, Nepal, China, and many other countries. We are pleased to welcome you in this international webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya, Professor Dr. Insinyur Pitoyo Trijuwono, MT IPU, the Honorable Vice Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya, Insinyur Ishardita Pambuditama, ST, MT, PST, IPU. The Honorable Head of Water Resources Engineering Department, Universitas Brawijaya, Dr. Insinyur Usi Andawayanti, MS, and our speakers today. The Honorable Professor Dr. Insinyur Eko Winar Irianto, on behalf of Directorate General of Water Resources, Ministry of Public Works and Housing, Republic of Indonesia. The Honorable Insinyur Ramon Valian Ruritan, STMT, from Jasa Tertawan Public Corporation. The Honorable Professor Danu Rulfing, PSD, from ISE Delft, Netherlands. The Honorable Moderator and all the participants who attend this event today, welcome to International Webinar Series, Living with Our Certainty, Sustainable Coastal Area, and River Basin Management in Indonesia. Past, present, future, October 24, 2020. As part of the ceremony, we are going to listen National Anthem of Republic of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya.
Now, we are going to listen to welcome speech delivered by Vice Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Insinyur Ishardita Pambuditama, STMT PSD APU. Mr. Ishardita, time is yours. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear Professor Eko Winar Irianti, on behalf of the Director General of Water Resources, Ministry of Public Work and Housing, Republic of Indonesia, Insinyur Raymond Valian, STMT, the President Director of Jasa Tirta One Public Corporation, and please allow me to express my sincere appreciation to Professor Danu Rolfing of IHC Delft, Netherlands. And in particular, I would like to extend my gratitude to distinguished guests from abroad, which extend across 20 countries in the world. Distinguished guests, respected colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya, I would like to thank all of you for having made the time to attend this international webinar, Living with Uncertainty, Sustainable Coastal Area and River Basin Management in Indonesia, Past, Present, and Future. I will come, all of you, and hope that today's event will serve as a catalyst for strengthening national and international cooperation on the transfer of knowledge related to water engineering and management. We at the Universitas Brawijaya have committed to continue striving to attain the 500 World University Ranking as we have always wished to be recognized as one of the most prestigious universities in the world with the following features of innovation, internationalization, and interdisciplinary research. Universitas Brawijaya has already expanded to a world-class university and has persistently demonstrated its cutting edge technology to become one of the global leaders in higher education. Today's international webinar is very meaningful event where we can share experiences, knowledge and innovative technology. I do hope that all of the distinguished guests gathered today will offer their generous support for the successful of the international webinar. Thank you for your participation and support. I wish all of you very successful webinar enjoy the lectures and have a nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Isartita, for welcoming speech. Ladies and gentlemen, according to our schedule, we are going to continue presentation and discussion that will be guided by our moderator, Bambang Winarta, STMT, PhD, one of our lecturers who is focusing on coastal engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome our moderator today, Bambang Winarta, STMT, PSD. Mr. Bambang, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Doctor of Engineering at the Norjaya. Good afternoon, everybody. And once again, welcome to international webinar on living with uncertainty, sustainable coastal area, and river basin management in Indonesia, past, present, and future. My name is Bambang Winarta. I will be responsible for hosting this presentation today. First of all, let me introduce our speaker today. Our first speaker is Professor Eko Winar Irianto on behalf of the Director General of Water Resources, the Ministry of Public Work and Housing, the Republic of Indonesia. Professor Eko Winar Irianto earned Bachelor and Master degree of Environmental Engineering at ITB Bandung. And in 2014, he has completed a doctoral program at Civil Engineering Departments, Parahyangan Catholic University, Bandung, Indonesia. Currently, he is a Director of Engineering Affairs, Directorate of Water Resources, the Ministry of Public Work and Housing, the Republic of Indonesia. Second speaker is Mr. Raymond Valian Ruritan. He received a degree of Water Resources Engineering at Universitas of Brawijaya, and in 2007, 
He has successfully completed postgraduate program at Civil Engineering Department at SM University, Universitas of Brawijaya, Malang, Indonesia. 2012 to 2017, he was the director of engineering the just of Jasatirtawan Public Corporation. And at this time, he is a president director of Jasatirtawan Public Corporation, a refurbishing organization in the Republic of Indonesia. And our third speaker today is Professor Danu Roving, Professor of Coastal Engineering and Port Development, IHE Delft, Netherlands. Professor Roving, got PhD degree at Delft University of Technology in 1993. He has more than 30 years of experience in coastal engineering and research. He has managed the development of some software such as Delft 3D, Xbeach, and Shoreline S. Since 2005, he has been the head of chair group Coastal System engineering and fourth development at IHA Delft, Netherlands. In 2017, he received the International Coastal Engineering Award from the Coast, Ocean, Port and River Institute, COPRI of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And in 2019, he was Coastal Award winner. They are our speaker today. So before we start, I would like to inform you that we will share attendance and question link during the presentation. If you have any question, you can uh, put it in that links or you, you can write your question in that links. And also attendance link will be shared during the presentation of the third speakers. Professor Ekowinar Irianto, uh, Mr. Raymond Valiant and Professor Dano Roving, we have to say sorry that you only have 30 minutes to end up your okay. presentation. Okay. Now we can begin. Our yeah. first speaker is Professor Eko Winner Irianto, Director of Engineering Affairs, Directorate of Water Resources, the Ministry of Public Work and Housing, the Republic of Indonesia. Yeah. Professor Eko, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On behalf of my Director General, I will express and I will thank you and honor, very honor to in, to be invited here and to make uh, for making uh, information about the castle situation in, 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 in Indonesia, future and also, and, and also in the future. Okay, uh, please, uh, please, the, the, yeah, the presentation. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. The present and the future of sustainable coastal management in Indonesia, the perspective of the policy makers. This is my presentation today. Okay, next. Next. Yeah, current issue. Next. Yeah, please. Next, please. Yeah, Indonesia coastal, Indonesia has the potential coastal. That is, sorry, uh, back, back, so back, back again. First, first, uh, sorry, second, second slide. Hello, second slide. Ah, yes, thank you. Indonesia has uh, back. Next, next. Uh, Sorry, next, next. Sorry, next. Yes, yes. Indonesia is uh, has a, a coastal potential protection. Uh, unfortunately, the cost, uh, the situation in the coastal 
in Indonesia is needs to be protect because of 20% are facing erosion and abrasion problem such as Bali Island coastline and also coastal erosion threaten the productive land and tourism area could also trigger national border change due to coastline change around borders intensity and magnitude and magnitude of the erosion due to climate change also increases sedimentation which affects the sea navigation the issue of coastline setback is increasing while the availability of budgets more or less remains the same okay next hello next next okay this is a pictures of, and scheme of the sustainable coastal management that needs to optimize to avoid the conflicts okay next yeah, because of uh, yeah yeah this is a need to implement the concept of integrated coastal zone management yes like such like a system understanding and identification okay yes okay police yeah okay next next hello next okay please next yeah the legal basis management law of the republic of indonesia number 27 2007 it's uh, said uh, sorry sorry it is too fast yeah okay this is a president presidential decree number six 2017 concerning management of small or thermos islands 111 okay this is management of coastal area and small island is a coordinating plan utilization supervision and control coastal resources and small island carried out by the government and local government between all sectors, including terrestrial, sea ecosystem, science and management to enhance people's welfare. Okay, next. Yes, it is, uh, there is uh, 111 small islands are located in the outer boundaries of Indonesia. So this is a needs of attention. Okay, next. Yeah, coastal protection policy is an effort to protect and secure coastal areas and river estuaries from damage due to erosion, abrasion, and secretion, and accretion, sorry. Okay, next. Yeah, next. Yeah. Coastal protection policy, alternative coastal treatment approaches. This is first is prevention, this is for arrangement and coastal boundaries. Second, maybe do nothing, but needs to be, but still needs to be protected. And third, relocation of the registry residents, yeah, which related to the socioeconomic costs requires coordination with the local government. And fourth, replanting mangrove at the coastal area that have been damaged by abrasion and erosion. And fifth, coastal protection structure for coastal area that have developed and really need to be shakers. This is the last choice. Okay, please. Okay, okay next. Yeah. We can see that uh, in the left side is communities that live along the coast from the threat of the high tide waves and Indonesian, and Indonesian or we call ROP. And uh, the second is erosion, abrasion, and accretion conditions. And much, and this is there is a condition. And then also public facilities, social facilities area that have high economic value, historical value, and national strategic value that are located along the coast. So, yeah. So that is construction of coastal structures new and rehabilitation at existing structure and operation and maintenance of coastal protection structures. Okay. Next, yeah. 
Okay, next. Yeah. So this, yeah, okay, next again. Yeah, okay, next. This is a strategic plan for Indonesia coastal protection. Okay, next, yeah. Next. Okay, yeah, this is also a strategic plan for, cost for Indonesia coastal protection. Next. Yeah. Okay. This is a strategic and strategic plan and realization of Indonesia coastal protection. So you can see the plan, the plan, and also realization in, in each uh, islands like uh, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Java, Sulawesi, Nusa Tenggara, and Papua. Okay. Okay. Next. Yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. this is uh, information about the coastal protection activities in the border area, such as like in uh, Rio province, Rio, Rio Island province, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is uh, integrated coastal zone management in future perspective of the policy maker. So, next. Okay, next. Yeah. Okay, next this is baseline of Indonesian coastal protection. Okay, next. Okay, next. Yeah, this is an example of the handling and coastal protection protection plan. Yeah, we called uh, in 2019. There is a handling coastal protection and also the plan of the coastal protection proposal for 2020 to 2024. Okay, okay next. Okay, next. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Development of the small outer island. The Ministry of Public Works announcing is supporting achievement of the national development agenda. As we called uh, in RPGMN 2005 and 2019, and based on the integrated region inf infrastructure, which the objective is water damage control to increase the community resilience and reducing the risk of water damage, includes climate change through the handling of the flood affected areas, volcanic sediments, lava, and coastal abrasion. So the categories of marine conservation area in coastal area and small island, A is a marine conservation area in small island, like a coastal sanctuary, small island sanctuary, and coastal park, and also small island park. B, maritime, maritime conservation area, uh, such like uh, maritime traditional protection area, maritime culture protection area, and uh, such as marine national park, marine national marine nature can sanctuary, marine tourism park, and fisheries park, and also sempadan pantai. Sempadan it's mean uh, coastland area, coastland area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next. Next. Hmm. Yeah. So there is uh, implementation of the waterfront city concept. The selection of waterfront city concept need to post coastal geomorphology, second, geologic landforms, and third, coastal line condition and fought with exposure. Based on the data will determine the adaptive strategy. First, site strategy. Yeah. Okay, next.
Oke, okay, next. Ya, yeah. this, this is uh, in uh, development of the national tourism area, strat tourism strategic area. Ya, yeah. infrastructure. development in its NTSA yeah for infrastructure development okay next yeah okay next Next, next, yeah, fishing area arrangements. Indonesia has a large number of coastal areas, so the arrangement of these 11 areas will be an example for the local government to reform the coastal area. The program of arranging the fishing settlements and water site villages of the Ministry of Public Work and Housing not only improves the physical infrastructures, but also invites the community to maintain environmental hygiene by not disposing the waste and littering to improve the level of health and local economy around the coastal area. Okay, next. Yeah, okay. We, we will inform the innovation of public work and housing in coastal engineering. Okay, please, next, next, please. Yeah. Modular concrete coastal protection structures. We have uh, interlock hollow and step ladder refitment, we call 3D, berkait, berongga, and bertangga, and interlocal refitment, berkiki. Yeah. Modular, modular concrete create coastal protection structures is a coastal protection technology to prevent the coast from landslide and the retreat of the shoreline due to erosion which has an interlocal which has an interlocking structural system yeah precast concrete from uh, for modular system of course to substitute for natural materials rapid construction on site easy maintenance and high quality because of the control condition in the factory. Advantages, first protect the coast effectively, second high stability, and third wave attenuation is very attractive, fourth low, low, low wave run up, and fifth good accessibility, and sixth attractive aesthetics. Okay, next please. Yeah, this is uh, information about the interlock hollow step ladder, ref, uh, in, uh, step ladder refitment. Yeah, okay, TV. Okay, next please. Yeah, this is a semi interlocking refitment. Yeah, okay, and this the the pictures is also how to how to test the system of interlocking refitment in laboratory. Okay, next, next please. Yeah, this is a submerged breakwater we call pegar, pengendali gelombang ambang rendah, yeah. Advantages, not interfere with the view towards the sea because it is installed at the at a low water level. Yeah. Second, cheaper than conventional breakwater. And the third, better water circulation, which allows for improved water quality and biological productivity and reduce the effect of drug on sediment transport. Fourth, environmentally friendly. And fifth, uh, solution for natural stone scarcity. Yeah, Coastal protection structure built parallel to the coast to reduce wave energy that can cause erosion, allow sedimentation and 
coastal restoration erosion affected. Okay. Next, please. Okay. Next, please. Yeah. Yeah. This is an example how to apply the technology, the future technologies of uh, uh, coastal protection. This is a interlock host, uh, hollow step loader refinement in Happy Beach Valley, applied in Happy Beach Valley. And also this is a combination of interlock hollow and stone armor, waterfront city Morotai, Maluku Utara, not Northern Maluku. And also semi interlocking refinement, yeah. Happy Beach Valley. And this is a submerged breakwater or in the Banten, in the Banten area, Put, Putih Pasir Beach in Banten. Okay, next please. Okay, next please. Yeah, next please, next. Next. Yeah, we, we, we will inform about the National Capital Integrated Coastal Development or NCICD. Next. Okay, next please. Yeah, yeah. Frequent flooding in Jakarta from both the sea and rivers. Key factor is land subsidence due to excessive groundwater extraction. Land subsidence in coastal area among 7.5 till 13, 7, 13 centimeter per year. So, Low safety level for coastal dikes and river embankment cause frequent flooding. High risk and damage in maybe 2030, 2.5 million people at 12,000 12, hectare affected in North Jakarta. And also the Sukarno Hatta International Airport, Tanjung Priok Port, power plant and roads be inundated. inundated. So, Substance, substance, substantial solution is required to protect Jakarta people from the flood uh, caused by coastal uh, flooding. Okay. Next. Okay, next please. Next, this, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is a history of NCICD, yeah. From 2012, Jakarta Coastal Defense Strategy until 20, 2014, yeah, NCICD Master Plan, and then integrated flood safety plan to 2019. Okay, next, yeah. Yeah, next, next please. Yeah, okay, next please. Okay, this is background of NCIC, I think, okay. Yeah, okay, next please. Yeah. yeah, next please. So, background of NCICD first is reducing flood threats. Yeah, yeah that is land subsidence control, flood countermeasure from the sea and the river, and reducing local inundation with poultry system. And the second, developing, developing productivity in coastal area. That is development of recent residential, commercial, and public space area integrated with multi purpose dike. Development of Northern Outer Ring Road in Jabodetabek integrated with multi purpose dike. Also, development of fishery growth area in National Fishery Center. The such improving environmental quality. That is, restoration of conservation functions in the upstream. And surface of groundwater quality improvement. Also, solid waste management, fleet water provision clean building concept, and mangrove conservation and relocation. Fourth, revitalizing 
social culture aspects in coastal area. That is public dock construction, development of coastal community village, public space construction, and revert revitalization of coastal heritage. Okay. Next, please. Yeah, this is a core plan of NCICD. The first is enhancement of coastal and river dike, yes. And then there is a land development and also this is a re retention to manage water level and the water level pump to the sea, yeah. Or, uh, uh, through the outer sea dike, okay. Okay, next please. Okay, next please. Yeah, this is a conceptual designs of uh, NCICD. Yeah, the no regret measure 2030 is first is for flood protection, yeah, coastal and river dikes, and second land subsidence control, pipe water supply and stopping groundwater extraction, and third is sanitation improvement. That is a Jakarta sewer system and also Sanimas and Ipal and wastewater system communal. Okay, next please. Yeah, next please. Okay, okay, next please. Okay, this is. Next, please. Okay, next, please. Okay, okay, please. Okay, next please. Next please. <laughs> yeah, okay. We want to inf inform about the policy system in Semarang. Okay, next please. Okay, there. Yes, next, please. Yeah, this is a system of the flood and drop control in East Semarang regions. Yeah, this is a folder system to collect the drainage from Semarang City and also to protect the uh, flood flat coast, yeah, rock from the sea, from the Java Sea. Okay, next, next please. Okay, next please. Yeah, next please, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, the folder system conceptual design, it's mean the first is normalization and parapet, Sungai Tenggang Excel change, and also normalization and parapet, Sungai Tenggang paket satu in the first paket and the second paket. And this is a sea dike and retention basin. Yeah, okay, next please. Yeah, next please. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is a conceptual design of folder system in Semarang. Yeah, this is a folder system. This is pump, yeah, and also uh, the level floods of the Sungai Seringin in the Semarang city. 
Okay, next please. Okay, next please. Yeah. This is a story gate and swing in river dike. Yeah. Okay. Next please. In Semarang. Next please. Okay, next please. Yeah, this is a uh, Rusun Nawa. This is as uh, a mean uh, Kalika we retention basin. Yeah, in Semarang also. Yeah, the, the retention basin of near Rusun Nawa Kalika we. This is uh, uh, to protect can also to storage the drainage and the drainage from Semarang City. Yeah. Okay, next please. Next please, yes. Yeah. Okay, this is uh thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, we have a symbol, icons, artworks, move fast and appropriately thank you very much for your attention thank you okay. Uh, okay thank you very much for eco winner irianto for your nice presentation actually you still have five minutes but it's okay we will accumulate it during uh discussion session so discussion will be more and more okay just remind all of you if you have any question so you can write them in the question link that we already searched in the chat box yeah. So we are going to the second speaker, Mr. Ramon Valiant, President Director of Jasa Tirtawan Public Corporation. Mr. Ramon, now is your time. Everybody, uh, I hope that we all having a good session this afternoon. And first of all, I would like to congratulate the Faculty of Engineering for its 57th anniversary and as well the water resources department for its 44th anniversary. Uh, it's an honor for Jasatirta Corporation to join this webinar and on behalf of our company we kindly express our gratitude and appreciation to this webinar. Uh, allow me to share some slides concerning the present and future of the integrated water resource management at the river basin level. Whereas I have been working in the river management for almost 23 years. So I think probably we could share something that will be useful for our discussion this afternoon. Allow me to share some screens first. Our today conversation will be on integrated water resources management at the basin level, uh, the present and the future. Uh, allow me first to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Raymond Valiant. I work for Chesa Tirta One Public Corporation. We are a state-owned enterprise uh, working in the water resources management and we are assigned by the government of Indonesia to conduct uh, specific activities in the river basins, which are five already that are bestowed by the government to our responsibility. First of all, I would like to address why such webinar is important. Uh, there is a common need for both the resources professionals and basically it is because there are a lot of relationship between water resources and the well-being of the human living. In the health sector, there are 800,000 children that die annually due to diarrhea and water-related diseases. In terms of water scarcity, we know that 3.6 billion people live in areas that are potentially water scarce, and this could increase to 4.8 or at least going to 5.7 billion by the year 2050. We can also see that life is also concerned because number of people that are at risk 
from flood is projected to rise from 1.2 billion today to around 1.6 billion by 2050. In other terms, like food security, we can see that agriculture accounts for about 70% of all water withdrawn by these sectors, including the energy. In terms of the ecosystem, we can see also that since the year 19,000, an estimated 64 to 21% of the natural wetland areas worldwide has been lost due to human activity. And finally, we can see that risk, especially the environmental risk, is continued to dominate, including to the annual global risk perception that has been done last year. We are living in a life of crisis and water crisis is one of the upcoming threats as the World Economic Forum has shown us that due to the current condition where we are living in scarcity, where there's a bigger risk of water related diseases and conflicts about water, water crisis has become to a certain important an issue among a lot of countries in the world, including in Indonesia. And that's why I can quote Madam Ferguson that has said that another strong force for change is crisis. As we are now in the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, we have seen that disruption is not only happening to our daily lives, but change is happening due to a crisis. And the crisis is not only related to health issues, but it's growing also to other issues like economic, resource management, and human well-being. And we can see that in this condition, crisis is a strong force for change. That's why this afternoon, I'm happy to join this webinar because through this webinar, uh, we can have a lot of discussions. We create an environment where water professionals can discuss the issue on water resource management and coastal management as well. Allow me to go to the first slide. I think talking about water at the river, river basin level is talking about concepts. And talking about concept means that we, may, we shall meet challenges and we have to solve problems. And this is the importance of what we are discussing now that integrated river basin management is addressing challenges. Water can be seen to a lot of uh, perspectives. First, from the view that it's a control variable where water is a source of resilience, from a state variable where water is a victim of change, and as a driving variable where water is an agent of change. As we see that water as a source of resilience, we can see that it is holding our ecosystem functions. It creates the biomass growth and endorse the biodiversity. As a variable, water is also a victim of change due to land use change, erosion, sedimentation, water pollution, and other things. And as a driving factor, we can see that it's also an agent of change where social impacts due to flood and drought concerns our daily life that water can also be a driver for conflicts. And we can see that we are living actually on water in various aspects. This is an illustration how the interrelatedness between land, water, and the atmosphere had created our landscape. This is a photo taken in Indonesia in the near the spring of the Brantas River in East Java. And we can see that due to the high population and the driving economic moves in the agricultural sector at the uplands, this area that should be conserved has changed. This is another problem as well. How we deal with waste that is coming not only to our lands, but also to the water bodies. And if you have seen that most in rivers in Indonesia has become an alternative way of conveying waste. 35% of the waste in the rivers are non-biodegradable. And I think the less are organic matters. So the issue of waste and water is also becoming an issue where we can see the interrelatedness between our activities 
as humans in a river basin to watch the water in its catchment area. And now we are talking about basin management system. So first of all, basin management system means that we adopt a concept that is called integrated water resources management. This concept is an iterative process. It's not a singularity activity. It's not only one single step taken by institutions at first level, but it's an iterative process. And the entry levels are at various levels, either at the local level, at the implementation level, as well at the high level, which we call the policy level. And as we know that water is part of a hydrological cycle, this cycle involves not only the environment, land, and the atmosphere, but also our economic activities. Our population changes. Our activities that change the landscape, as well the integration with other capabilities that water creates in a river basin. And how can it be executed? Well, basin management relies on three important aspects. First, there's a political will. Second, there's law and policy to make it happen. And finally, the third thing is management framework. Allow me to go a bit, a bit on this issue. First, all water resources infrastructures happens because there is a political will from the state to the government to execute water resources activities and management systems. Without the political will, it will not be possible for us to construct infrastructures to adapt a management system to create water resources infrastructures all over the basin. As we can see, like the Monokiri Reservoir in the Bangan Solo was created because the initiative of our second president, Suharto. And the first reservoir in the Brantas Basin, as well as the first reservoir in the Chitarum River, was also created by the first president of Indonesia, Sukarno. So political will is an important issue in basin management system. Law come next, because without law, then a political will cannot be issued and it cannot work. And finally, what is important is the management framework. Uh, for the management framework, we can see that there are some operative concepts like the integrated water resources management that just has been recently adopted by Indonesia in the 80s. And an important figure that has introduced integrated water resources management was the late Professor Suyono Sosodarsono. He was also the conceptor and the supporter of the water resources department that has been established at the Brawijaya University in the Faculty of Engineering. So if this year the faculty uh, commemorate its 57th anniversary and the water resources department commemorates its 44th anniversary, then we need to also consider that Professor Suyono Sosodrasono has been a figure that creates this concept, the integrated water resources management concept, and introduce that concept into a framework. And as far as we know, water pressure is always there. Even if we have a management system, we can see that overall pressure is always there. Most countries are living in a condition where extremely high or high conditions of water stress and this will increase over the next 25 years. And we expect in 2050, there will be about 74 countries that is dealing with water crisis all over the world. Indonesia is a part of the crisis because we are in an archipelago. We have small rivers. We are having a small islands and a huge population, which create a bigger pressure in the water sector and especially at the river basin level. Allow me then to explain a bit about how this pressure is happening. Uh, this slide is showing us a simplified analysis on how water supply is solely relied on assigned infrastructures and how they create water discrepancy or water stress within the basin. 
We have two examples here of the Brantas River Basin and the Bengawan Solo River Basin, which are both managed by Chasapirta Public Corporation. These basins are now in a chronic shortage. Water crowding is expected between 1,700 capita per 1 million cubic meters annually, and the water use is 130 million cubic meters per capita annually. And that puts us in the condition where the Brantas River Basin is actually in an already chronic shortage. But almost all river basins in Java Island and part of the Bali Island are already in a crisis. That's mainly due to the high population, the high demand of water, and also the condition where precipitation occurs mainly during the rainy season. So storage is an issue, how to deliver water for various sector is an issue as well. And how can we manage at the river basin level? I think, first of all, it's about rules and mandate, how to regulate, how to manage, and how to create an operating surface. How water in a river basin can be managed, it can be delivered, it can be regulated and it can be monitored. And that involves certain core tasks, such as monitoring inventory, coordinating and regulating, planning and financing, as well developing and managing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think herewith I can introduce a few concepts that have been developed all around the world about how a river basin should be organized. There are a few typical uh, common forms of river basin organizations. It can form into a basin commission, like an authority. It happens in river basins in Nigeria. It can be also like a directorate. It's like an agency, like it has been in Japan. It can be also a loosely association in form of a council, like it is practiced in the United Kingdom. Or it can be a, move, a wholly corporate activity where the Riven Basin organization is actually a company, like we have seen in South Korea. In the Indonesian case, there are two types of river basin organization. First is the corporate type, which is Chasatirta, where I am now working for. And also another form, the government type of cooperative union, which is called the Balai Bilai Sungai or the Balai Besar Bilai Sungai. In this Indonesian case, we have like a dual system where part of the water development and management activity is operated by the government and certain activities in the water resources management is given in a concession form to a corporate state owned company like Jasatirta. And I think we can go further to see examples in other countries, in France, in Spain, in Mexico, Morocco, Australia, and Indonesia. If you can compare all those role and types of river basin management, we can see that there are two issues that are important. First, that the government needs to dedicate its resources towards a good management practice. And the second is that the water users and the stakeholders are required to participate in the integrated river basin management. Those two issues cannot be separated from how we manage the water. And examples from various countries have shown that this is the key towards a sustainable water resources management practice within the river basin. We can go further that this involves not only management system, but also water charges, which is financing the management development as well the implementation stage of the water resource and infrastructures. It involves also water supply, how we can separate the roles between municipalities, regencies, province, and the national levels. It involves also how we deliver irrigation and how we monitor the data. So it depends on how the government deliver the water resources concept and how the stakeholders and water users participate in this process. Another important issue in 
having an integrated water resources management practice at the river basin level is finance. How we finance the activities. There are a lot of possibility of financing sources in the river basin. First, we can have stewardship where people share their resources towards having a better water resources management system. We can also see that developing and maintaining infrastructures is required to be supported by strong financial grounds. And finally, we cannot evade that operation of the basin organization also requires financial sources. So in this case, managing water resources in the river basin means that either you rely on tax or the combination between tax and tariffs, which means charges and fees, or you do transfer between the sectors. And I think this is an issue that will define how we can finance a river basin management and how this management can be sustainable because without financial sources, it will be difficult to manage river basin. Let me give an example of how actually this financing can happen. First of all, we can see that in various ways, uh, water is an important prime mover for the energy sector. In the hydro sector in Indonesia, the independent power providers or the generating companies of electricity pays approximately 165 rupees for the water surface fee. And this is the lowest cost available from various generating power plants to provide energy. And this shows also that actually with a low price, the water can be used to, to generate electricity in a sustainable way. In Indonesia, we have a diverse kind of uh, in a power, power producing, power producers. Basically, it can be from hydro source, from coal, from fossil oils, gas, geothermal, gas and coal, and even solar cell. But the price, the lowest price, is always at the hydro sector. And this means that if we can put this mechanism into action, then the hydro sector can also support finance for the river basin management because it remains as the lowest cost into generating electricity. And this is a cycle that's possible to be implemented. We foresee this in various parts of in our country. And just at the one, abstracts or collect this water surface fee, which is known as the BGPSDR or the BI Jasa Pengelolaan Subadaya Air from the power producers. And we collect them to be utilized as a fund for managing water resources at the river basin level. So this involves stakeholders. It either be done at the local level, it can be done at the regional level, and it can be done at the national level. And if we want to have an integrated river basin management for the future, then strategic long-term plans are kindly required. First, it is a matter of identification of issues. Then it's about setting priorities, creating model and also decision support tools, and finally, managing opportunities. These are the strategic long-term requirements that is necessary to make a river basin management sustainable up until the future. Let me show some examples. The first example is from a transboundary river, which is the Senegal River Basin. It, was in, it is in the uh, southern part, uh, western part of Africa. The Senegal River Basin crosses three countries, Mali, Mauritania, and Senegal. And we can see here that the benefit of this river is shared among three countries with different percentage of different percentage of uh, benefit that is uh, received by each sector. The agriculture sector 
benefit the most in Senegal, about 58%, while in Mauritania it's only 31%, in Mali about 11%. On the contrary, the energy sector benefit the most from the Senegal River Basin in Mali for 52%, and less in Mauritania, about 15%, and about 33% in Senegal. In Mali, the Senegal River Basin also has an importance in navigation, while in Mauritania it's only 12%, and in Senegal it's about 6%. So considering these benefits, the river basin management must be coordinated in a synchronous way to make this benefit maximized at any level, at any stage, for any stakeholder. Another example is probably for the Brantas, Asahan, and Chitarum River in Indonesia, where we can see that in the Chitarum River, the biggest benefit is for, for the agriculture sector. While in the Asahan River Basin, the biggest benefit is for the energy sector, which generates electricity from the water power. And for the Brantas River Basin, on the contrary, the biggest benefit is received by the water supply sector. This shows that in every different river basin, we have different ways and different sectors that gain the benefit of the management. So in this consideration, we develop a strategic long-term plan for any river basin to the future. We kindly require the attention to this issue, how benefit among the sectors can be delivered, can be defined, and can be improve, can be amended to, in order to secure the water supply and improve the overall basin as activities. And that means also that we are having also to be careful to not overuse the river basin because either linear and non-linear tipping are possibly happening in the future due to climate change. It's possible that nonlinear tipping dynamics are possible to happen to river basins in the tropical area where their state of hydrological regime changes due to the climate change. And it can also happen that certain river basins endure linear concept collapse due to the riverine system that changes gradually due to the decrease of river influence. And this example has been all along our history of humanity. If we can see this example, first about the Middle East antique civilization, when we learn history, we know that in the past, there was a large Mesopotamian agriculture in the Euphrat and Tigris Basin, which is now in Iraq and Iran. It was between 262 to 1258 AD, where suddenly it decreases and this biophysical manifestation happens into land degradation, land salinization, and shift of the rivers, which create a social collapse where water supply collapses, agriculture system collapses, and Iraq induce a desertification about for 600 years, which is a linear basin collapse. And now we can see that Iran and Iraq are quite a dry area with less agriculture activities than it was in the past. And this is a problem that cannot be inverted. Another example is the Maya civilization in South America. It used to be an advanced civilization. It has approximately 90 million people and it flourishes between 800 to the year 900 AD. But there were some problems because the huge population deforestate the catchment area and this creates reduced pre precipitation and due to the effect of the La Nina and El Nino in the southern part of America, then severe drought has manifested. And due to the deforestation, reduced precipitation, and drought, 
that erosion and soil degradation happen. What happens to the Maya civilization that we have a social collapse, crop failure, the life support system collapses, the people abandon their centers, and you have a sudden collapse in the year 900 that the Maya civilization was completely abandoned and it is a nonlinear, unabruptive stop to that once big civilization in South America. Another example probably is the old Mataran kingdom. This is a kingdom in Java that flourishes between the year 650 to the year 900 AD. Basically, it's based on agriculture and trade. It relies its economic strength on river basins and the fertile island of Java. Problems occur when we can see volcanic activities increases and from the data that we have gained from historical evidence found in sediments in a lot of rivers and lakes that in the year 800 to the year 900, there was a huge climate variability that creates difficulties in farming practices. And at the same time, as the Sanjaya rulers of the old Mataram kingdom pushes their people to big monumental projects, there was a hydraulic despotism and the society collapses due to agricultural non-linear collapse, due to food insecurity, and the, the people migrated to the less adverse river basins. So the old Mataram kingdom moves from central Java to east Java due to the agricultural non-linear collapses and the food insecurity. Another current issue, how case departmental human activities have evolved is in the Syrian conflict, where rapid population growth and semi-agricultural base has now become a problem as there was a five-year drought, there was a reduced river inflow from Turkey, there was salinization and climate change. What happened now is there's water shortage, food insecurity for approximately one million people, unemployment and a continuous political and global tension in that country. Finally, I can say, where do we go? I think the key issue is that in water, we leave nobody behind. And it's always the big thirst, the turbulent future of the water that requires our attention at the river basin level. And integrity in the water sector is an important issue. I hope okay. Okay. that this is sufficient and we can have a discussion as time is nearing now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Raymond, for your attractive presentation. I think you. And then uh, once again, if you have any question, you can write them in the question link that we have shared in the chat box. Now we are jump to the third speaker, Professor Dana Roving, Professor of Coastal Engineering and Port Development, IHE Delft, Netherlands. Professor Dana Roving, now is your turn. Okay, th thank you very much. I'll share my screen. Oh, um, if you will let me share my screen. Um, host has disabled participant screen sharing, I'm afraid. Please wait, please wait a minute. We are the. Please share your screen. Okay. Roving. Yes.
Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, very honored to be part of this uh, webinar. Um, I'm uh, uh, delighted that uh, that we have such a nice collaboration with uh, the Universitas Bravijava. Um, and I'll be talking uh, about past, present, and future of sustainable coastal management from uh, a scientific perspective and also from our experience in uh, several parts of the world. Um, the, uh, the problem uh, is uh, often uh, glaring uh, in our eyes. Uh, we see communities uh, being heavily affected by coastal erosion, such as here in uh, Benin, in Cotonou, or also Inf important infrastructure of uh, uh, water treatment plants can be affected by coastal erosion. We see whole islands or barriers that, that can be eroded by hundreds of meters, in, like in the case here in the uh, Ivory Coast. Um, we can see uh, formerly very wealthy communities like here in Gonzagville in, in Ivory Coast also uh, where you see this used to be a swimming pool and, and so it was an affluent area but it has been reduced to rubble and in the meantime it has been completely cleared out uh, because of very severe erosion. <clears throat> uh, very often we see uh, uh, luxurious resorts uh, with manicured lawns uh, that are not able to maintain a decent beach in front of their hotel, like here in Playa del Carmen in Mexico. Um, in uh, not only sandy beaches, but especially also muddy coasts have uh, faced huge loss of mangrove belts and, and uh, as part of a, an er, enormous erosion problem also. Um, here's an example from uh, the Kamau Peninsula in Vietnam, in the south of Vietnam, uh, where tens of meters per year of erosion, this is a scale from uh, minus 25 to, to 30, uh, and, and red is erosion. So this whole area is, is heavily eroding um, and if we look at an area here, uh, then this uh, is with the present coastline. You still see uh, uh, signs of erosion, but this whole area used to be land uh, a couple of decades ago. So this uh, indicates how far things can go. Um, so what is causing these kind of changes? There's a, a range of causes. Um, one is that there's the degradation of mangrove and coral coasts that uh, leads to sediment losses. Um, for instance, because mud that is transported along the coast, as you see here at the north coast of Java, uh, there's a lot of mud being transported along the coast. And if you have mangroves and a tidal motion that goes in and out of those mangroves, then a lot of that can be trapped and can contribute to building land. Uh, otherwise, it will just disappear to deeper water and will not be of any use to, uh, to uh, the coastal communities. Um, a very important and often overlooked cause of erosion is sand mining. And it takes place on a staggering scale, uh, which is really measurable uh, on a global scale. It has been ciphered that uh, the total amount of sand and gravel used for construction is equal to the total sediment discharge of all the rivers worldwide. Here you see some examples, again from Ivory Coast, where a bunch of uh, big lorries is cleaning out a complete sand barrier. Uh, very often people build one small house and it takes about one pit like this, uh, but a lot of those pits uh, create a lot of erosion. And this is just a view from my hotel room in Vietnam where I saw four sand barges at the same time. Um, 
At the same time, uh, the total sediment discharge of all rivers worldwide is reduced dramatically. Uh, an example here is the, the, the Yangtze, where you see that the flow, the overall flow uh, of water is pretty much constant over the years, but the sediment uh, discharge has dramatically reduced. Uh, the, the Volta River is the same, same example, and I am sure many rivers in Indonesia face the same problem, especially after building of dams. Um, also, in a case here, like the, the Mississippi, uh, you, in the old days, it had many distributaries which would spread the mud around in a wide delta. But since, uh, because of navigation purposes, the river has been canalized um, uh, very much and, and, and the, the flow is channeled towards um, deeper water so that the, the mud just disappears and does not contribute to delta building anymore. Some basic concepts of, of to explain coastal erosion. Uh, if you have uh, uh, sediment transport along a surf zone, along a beach, uh, and, and the, the transport is constant everywhere, there is not a problem of erosion. But if you build a harbor, uh, then you may have a lot of accretion on one side and erosion on the other sides, side. And um, this is, for instance, what happened in Ivory Coast here, where the, the, whole, the old swimming pool I was showing somewhere over here. And here there's an enormous amount of uh, sedimentation that is uh, useless, in fact, and actually causes problems in this navigation channel. Uh, something that happens a lot is that former delta building, uh, because of uh, land degradation and erosion, uh, has built out coastlines. Um, and this is still happening uh, here and there in uh, and everywhere in Indonesia, for instance. Um, but then when you build a dam or, or reduce the, the upstream erosion, then you uh, create uh, uh, the, the, the waves still take the, the, the sediment away, uh, but there's no sediment pushing the land outward and therefore you get this kind of situations like here in Ghana, uh, where the road was almost eaten up by the coastal erosion. Another really major issue is the subsidence. Um, I'm sure you are extremely aware of it in Jakarta, where it is up, up to uh, uh, seven to 13 uh, centimeters per year. Um, locally, and, and this is a uh, huge. You have to realize that this is uh, an, an order of magnitude more than sea level rise. It has devastating effects on, uh, on shoreline erosion and the frequency of flooding. Uh, there are examples where it could be stopped, for instance, in Venice, which used to have a lot of subsidence until they drastically stopped the, the extraction of groundwater. But it is very common in tropical uh, areas, in Mekong Delta, uh, uh, near, it's also near Bangkok. Uh, all these large mega cities are sinking. Um, and even if you're in the neighborhood of a, of a large uh, city like Samarang, uh, you see that the, the coast is also uh, can be severely. Uh, uh, retreating, like illustrated here, the coast in 2002 and 2000, uh, what is it, eight and 2013. Uh, so this is erosion over, well, or land loss of kilometers. So the first lesson we uh, have here is that um, we, don't really need climate change to mess up our coasts. Uh, we uh, actually, uh, we're doing quite fine, uh, making a big mess of, of, of the management of our coasts. Um, 
of course, climate change will help uh, to be cynical. Um, we have to add this to, to our current problems because the, the current problems are not yet really related to sea level rise, although it is starting. Uh, but these are some scenarios. Uh, so the more common scenarios, uh, let's say, are in the range between 30 centimeters and a meter per uh, century uh, or by, the, by the, the end of this century. Uh, but there is increasing evidence that there uh, may be a, a rapid uh, calving, uh, sliding of ice caps into the sea and glaciers. And uh, that might add another uh, meter or so to the sea level rise. So we really have to, uh, we are extremely uh, vulnerable if we're in low lying areas and this is uh, coming at us. So some of the potential, I don't know how I can, um, potential climate change effects on costs uh, after Rana Singh and my colleague uh, Roche, um, is that there's a lot of uh, uh, episodic uh, changes because we can have uh, a different intensity or frequency of storms and storm surges. Uh, which leads to episodic uh, coastal inundation, uh, erosion of beaches, dunes and mangroves, uh, uh, formation and closure of small tidal inlets. I'll, uh, I'll show some example of that. And we can have also some medium term effects of increased erosion uh, uh, due to realignment of embayed beaches or uh, even permanent inundation of low-lying land, uh, as we just saw, but then not due to sea level rise, but due to uh, uh, land subsidence. And we can have chronic coastline recession. Now, an example of, of uh, inlet breaching that can happen more often uh, is like here, the development of wilderness breach after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this is a very narrow spit uh, where uh, the uh, uh, a breach happened during Sandy and where just an example of the kind of uh, modeling that we carry out uh, is the big question was here is will this uh, will this inlet close by itself or will it widen will it get out of hand because there's a lot of valuable uh, land behind this barrier that may be more flood prone uh, in this uh, in this case. And you see that modeling can be a very powerful tool here uh, in order to assess this kind of, uh, of uh, situation. So what should governments do in terms of uh, uh, intermediate conclusions? Uh, do not count too much on mitigation, that is the, 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 the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but expect up to one or two meter sea level rise by 2100. And stop groundwater extraction without recharge. It's worse than sea level rise. And when you design dams, ports, coastal protection schemes, consider the whole sediment sharing system and set up strong institutions to manage the coast where they are missing. And consider the following management options. Uh, no stopping any sediment, the sediment sharing zone, no mining anytime. Well, this may be somewhat overly optimistic, but uh, let at least, let's at least try this. So what kind of options do we have to maintain the coastline? Uh, we, we have a lot of hard options. I, we saw quite a few of them in the, in the first talk also, like seawalls, groins, offshore breakwaters. And they can provide local and but often temporary relief from erosion. The big issue with them is they do not address the sediment deficit. They always have lee side effects. 
and they are costly and do require maintenance. Uh, sometimes they actually worsen the situation. Here's an example in Cotonou in Benin, where the black line is the original coastline, and then groins were built. Um, oh, and before uh, the groins were built, the coastline was retreating uh, at this pace in 10 years' time to the blue line. And then after the groin was built, there was some stabilization here, but a lot of erosion here. Uh, and you see in three years time, the coast retreated by an unacceptable amount. So what alternative do we have? We can have soft options, nourishment, near shore or on the beach, which directly address the sediment deficit. And after some disturbance, the beach is returned to a natural state. It needs to be repeated regularly. And the latest trend is to do me mega nourishments, which get much cheaper per cubic meter if you have a large nourishment. An example of this, uh, this is a, a well-nourished coast. This is where uh, close to where I live. Uh, I can go there by bike and, and, and this is a beautiful beach. And all these dunes are naturally grown because of offshore nourishments. Uh, we also have the sand motor. You see here, standing on the sand motor, looking at the Hague. Um, you see the projected development over the first 20 years. So this was a huge uh, chunk of sand built in an interesting shape uh, and predicted to, uh, to deform like this and to feed the coast during 20 to 50 years. And uh, I think this is an interesting concept. It's also scientifically interesting experiment. You see here what happened pretty close to what the models were saying. And here we see my latest model shoreline S that is also able to, to simulate this in a, in a very nice way. And here's some scientific validation of this software to show that indeed the evolution as it is uh, modeled is well captured, I mean, well captures the actual evolution. So saving our shores, the Netherlands has shown that an erosive trend can be reversed by systematic nourishments. It does require thinking big. A couple of cubic meters doesn't help. And hard solutions rarely solve the problem and change shorelines into concrete. Retreating can be a sensible adaptation if no sand is available. But you need a long-term strategy and commitment to managing risks of flooding and coastal erosion. We just finished a very useful project called riskkit.eu to provide a number of those, those tools. Also, especially interesting for the case of Indonesia, what are the options for mangrove restoration? Huh? Um, first of all, reduce the subsidence. Huh? So try to, to, to attack the cause and, and, and not the symptoms. Huh? We can try to increase the sediment concentrations upstream, um, or we can try to create quiet conditions using structures, hard or soft. And for instance, there's a, a building with nature project in uh, Demak uh, Regency that, uh, that, that has, has tried this. Uh, planting mangroves uh, can be sometimes a solution, but usually if you create the conditions for mangroves to grow, then planting is not really necessary. Uh, you might think of creating protective sandbanks or cheniers, or maybe pump large amounts of mud towards the shore. Of course, all these soft solutions depend on the availability of, of sediment and on um, the willingness to contract large uh, operations uh, to, uh, to, to, to 
take large quantities of sediment towards the shore. In, uh, there's an example of what happens if you have an abundance of sediment. Uh, I, uh, my student, uh, PhD uh, student, Sebrian, uh, is uh, doing a research on the Lucy uh, uh, mud volcano now that has produced high sediment volumes. And the Porong River shows a lot of new mangrove growth due to the mud. Uh, you see an example of along the banks of the, the, these young mangroves that have, are growing along the banks of the Porong River. And Sebrian has been analyzing Google Earth engine data. And you see here the evolution from the beginning, uh, the increasing growth of the green areas is mangrove areas as detected from satellite imagery. And you see that's been a huge uh, accumulation here. And we can even see the age of the mangroves by creating this kind of animation. And so the red is, is, is the youngest mangroves and the dark blue is the oldest. So to come back to Jakarta, which was already uh, uh, mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in the first uh, talk by Professor Eko, um, it, um, uh, here's an example of a flood ri uh, risk map, uh, just one of the, the scenarios in 2036. And you see that substantial parts of Jakarta um, uh, are at risk of inundation by up to uh, one to three meters, uh, or more than three meters, actually. Um, so a lot of issues are at stake here, of course, and, and simple solutions are not, not possible. Um, but one may wonder if a really mega project uh, such as this is the most appropriate uh, to, to attack uh, uh, problems in this, uh, mainly in this area. Um, and, but we can maybe see this as a, as a horizon, uh, a project that will only maybe ever become feasible after 2050. But in the meantime, a lot of other things can and should happen, I think. And I've just been sketching this morning a little bit just just to uh, uh, indicate you might uh, polarize uh, uh, area by area you might strengthen the the river and coastal dikes and make sure that that the the rivers can discharge the the floods uh, efficiently uh, through there and that these areas are protected against the river floods and of course you have to also uh, make sure that you pump out uh, the water from these polders then. Uh, but then, uh, well, three meters uh, below sea level or below flood level doesn't impress us much. Uh, I personally was uh, raised in Rotterdam at uh, minus six. Um, so uh, it is all a matter of, of willingness to, to save uh, the city. Of course, we need to also take care of having some uh, retention areas and probably build a lot more. Um, so, and the main thing that is really, uh, as was already uh, uh, discussed by, by Professor Eko, um, the, the uh, uh, piping in of water is an essential part of the solution and it should have the highest priority of everything. So, uh, and maybe if there's a question, if there's enough water, I think there is enough water, but uh, maybe using uh, irrigation water just a little bit more efficiently could uh, greatly uh, help the availability of water supply for drinking water and, and for domestic use. So my two cents uh, of advice, of course, 
would be to reduce flooding by creating manageable dike rings, uh, very much like the concept that we're used to in Holland. And create also water retention areas and green spaces, install adequate pumping facilities, and maybe they can be run by local water boards responsible for flood risk, drinking water and sewage, and especially the maintenance of all that. Uh, enhance the conveyance of rivers, of course, by cleaning, dredging, widening, stop the groundwater extraction, connect to pipes, water, and reduce pollution of all sorts, uh, improve and clean up neighborhood by neighborhood. So I don't think we should count on mega structure to solve all problems. It's a distraction from the real issues, but this is my personal opinion. I would like finally to go, as my time is running out, to the risk management cycle. Uh, how we should manage our coast and flood risk, coastal erosion. We should understand the risk, manage the likelihood, help people to manage their own risk, prevent inappropriate development and improve flood prediction, warning and post flood recovery. And then we go through this cycle. And as an example, we could look at tsunami risk, is a beautiful image uh, created by one of my Peruvian students. Uh, so understand the risk, manage the likelihood, etc. cetera. Um, first, understand the risk. Here's an example of a recent paper that explains the, 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 the risk of a, of a tsunami from seismic gaps south of Java. Uh, this, these kind of studies are extremely important. Um, manage the likelihood. Well, this is not so easy, I think, in the Indonesian context. Um, in Japan, of course, they are building tsunami walls, but there they have very, very frequent tsunamis. Um, help people to manage their own risk. I think there is a lot that can be done, like building sturdier houses, planning evacuation routes and shelters, like this cyclone shelter in Bangladesh. This has this kind of structure has helped save hundreds of thousands of lives in Bangladesh, for instance. Uh, prevent inappropriate development well, where possible. And improve flood prediction, warning and post-event recovery. As, as a high priority, maintain the tsunami warning sensor system that is, uh, well, not always operational. Transmit early warning through sirens, WhatsApp, etc., and make sure everyone knows where to go and has somewhere to go to. So my conclusions are that science and engineering can provide strong support for sustainable coastal management. And modeling can be applied to a range of problems at scales from short-term events to long-term evolution and structural erosion. Soft and nature-based solutions are often preferable to hard, inflexible structures. And strong institutions are needed from local to regional to national level. And we need to keep going through the risk management cycle. And with that, I would, uh, oh, this, uh, I would say, like to say terima kasi, and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Roding, for your uh, nice presentation. Now we are in the question and answer session. Wait a minute. The uh, press uh, the question will be provided after this.
Oke, okay. Mr. Bambang. Oke, okay. uh, for the first questions from Mr. Haryadi Indra Mantong from River Basin Organization, Sulawesi 3. The question is for all of the speakers. How does Indonesian government dealing with land subsidian or land deformation at the coastal area and at the river basin in case of landslide, flash flood with debris, and etc. And put into account in the integrated water resources management also, how do you speakers think about the application of the hydraulic modeling become a primary tools of water management in Indonesia? Is it possible to apply in all river basins if it is when or what year from now? Okay, Mr. Bambang, you can continue. Okay, I think the first question for all speakers, maybe we can start from uh, Professor Danuro thinks or perhaps Professor Eko Winar Irianto or others, please. I could say something about the modeling. Um, I think uh, at a level of, uh, th there's different levels at which modeling uh, can be applied. I mean, the models, uh, the concepts and the, the model tools are available and they're already widely used by consultants and more and more governments also. But you have um, to think about modeling for design uh, which is sort of a, a one-time um, exercise or operational management. And there are more and more flood early warning systems, for instance, that, that run continuously and that, uh, uh, well, that can be set up for every river basin. And of course, every river basin has different characteristics, uh, but, uh, but a good coupling between local meteorological models uh, uh, tidal and surge models, and, and then the river uh, 1D or, or 2, uh, 2D uh, model systems uh, can, be, can be applied. I cannot say when. Uh, I mean, this, this really depends uh, on, the, on uh, the organization of each uh, river basin. But uh, uh, let's say if, if your commission uh, decides uh, or your organization decides to, to, to set up uh, a, a river basin uh, operational uh, system, then uh, it, it could, be, could be operational in a couple of years. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Olding. Uh, perhaps from Professor Eko Winarianto, you will give additional opinion about the first question from Haryadi Indra Mantong from River Basin Organization. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, hello? Okay, thank you very much for your uh, question. So uh, basically, uh, like, uh, Indonesia have a uh, government of Indonesia and mainly of the Directorate General of Water Resources is very attention with the uh, with the coastline problem, yeah. Because the coastline problem is uh, very difficult if there is a move, uh, there is move the coastline, yeah. Maybe making uh, making uh, uh, interfere to the navigation and also then making interfere to the uh, conflicts. Nah, this is uh, needs to need special attention for the government path because of the situation. We make a program uh, step by steps to solution to to make solution for the coastline problem. So and then uh, we also we have a, we have a physical laboratory modeling for, for especially for coastline for coastline uh, modeling yeah we the laboratory the laboratory modeling for coastline is uh, in the bali island in the buleleng buleleng regency 
is this uh, the laboratory laboratory for coastline uh, laboratory for coastline modeling that is in Buleleng Regency in Bali okay if you want if you want to connect the situation and and maybe you will make the uh, physical modeling so please contact the uh, our college in in Buleleng Regency laboratory of the coastline modeling okay thank you very much for your uh, dr leo sembiring yeah ah yes right right dr leo sembiring yes. thank you very much <laughs> you will know and now dr adi prastio yeah okay okay thank you very much Propeco. i think i yeah. already visited that place maybe ah, okay. last thank year you. yeah Okay, mm, and okay, then okay. maybe Mr. Raymond uh, Valiant, do you have mm. any additional opinion for this question? Uh, modeling is a tool, and for refurbishment management, I mean integrated board resources management, such tool relies on data availability. You have to maintain data in a structured way, and also to utilize that at any level that is desired. So there are models that are used to create uh, understanding about the strategic plan for the basin, but there are also models that are more operational into, for example, uh, running a hydrograph for a recent uh, storm or something like that. So it depends on what kind of model you want to use at the river basin level and at what kind of level of decision making or for what kind of operative action you are wanting to do that. So it depends on consistency, data, and as well financing the model itself. I think that are my comments. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Raymond. I think it's very comprehensive answer because come from three speaker, Professor Loving, Professor Eko, and also, Mr. Raymond, thank you very much. I think we are going to the next question. It's from uh, Suraji, uh, coordinating Ministry of for Maritime Affairs and Investment. The question also for all the speaker. So how the development of infrastructure on the coast can synergize with the effort to deal with flood and air drop coastal management, especially in Pandora, and how eco-friendly design are applied. Could you could you explain to me and once more that what ROB uh, stands for and Pantura? Pantura is coastal line in the north part of Java. Okay, and then. ROB in here, maybe this one is kind of a rough flood. Yeah, I think it is kind of flood, ROB in here. Yeah, kind of flood usually occur uh, in the coastal line. Okay, oh, okay. Um. Well, I think the uh, if if I if I may, um, the 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 big issue is really how to design uh, infrastructure, how to develop infrastructure in such a way that it doesn't do too much damage to the coast. Uh, um, uh, very often, uh, the the infrastructure is built out quite far. Uh, very close to the coast or even sticking out of the coast uh, and is thereby influencing all kinds of uh, uh, patterns of flow and sediment uh, that, that can uh, be harmful. Um, so if you would ask me, I would say, uh, don't put everything on the coastline, but try to keep it back a little bit so that there's room for developing uh, more natural, uh, softer uh, boundaries with the coastline. Uh, but the tendency is to build infrastructure out 
right uh, around around ports that are necessarily sticking out into the coast. So I think that that is a, a, a point of, uh, of worry, especially in the north coast of Java, I think. Thank you very, very okay. much, Prof. Uh, yeah. Prof. Eko, I think okay. you are... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I could try to uh, to answer this question. So, uh, we can integrate the flood and rob, yeah, rob uh, problems to solve the situation. This is, it might be which... Uh, it might be with the combined with the dike system and prop and polder system. Of course, we should uh, we should uh, check yeah, the geotechnical and topography situation before the before we design the structure of uh, of the of the flood and drop problem. That's it. Okay. So that's that's is our answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thanks, uh, Prof. Eko. Perhaps yeah. uh, Mr. Raymond yeah. will give additional opinion about the second mm -hmm. question. Uh, I think it has been comprehensively answered by mm -hmm. Prof. Eko and uh, by, <laughs> by Erwin. So I think that the best way to deal with the land subsidence, the best mm -hmm. way to deal with lots is by addressing the issue in case-wise and at the at various levels, not only at the big structure only, but also at local approaches and ways to yeah. mitigate the risk. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all speakers for the answers. We still have more than 15 minutes. You now I try to open for everyone who are willing to ask the speaker directly, please, please use the right hand button. Okay, I see in here, uh, that is Ikas Bayang. Please. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to address my question to the Mr. Raymond Palian, the second speaker, regarding uh, to environmental flow for sorry, yeah, regarding uh, to environmental flow to um, basin risks uh, in Indonesia. Uh, terminology of uh, environmental flow uh, commonly use uh, probability uh, scale key 95 pa uh, actually the uh, the law or the pp number 38 uh, it's already take down and uh, my question is uh, what is the definition for uh, the new definition for the um, environmental flow in in certain uh, basins or in the certain river? What is the uh, classification to determine the environmental flow, the water level for uh, sustainability, ecological, uh, riparian vegetation or animal habitat in certain uh, river. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Raymond, is it clear for you the question? Yes. Uh, Ibu uh, Ika, thank you for the, the comprehensive question. First of all, maintenance flow or environmental flow at the river is not only a matter of quantity, but also a matter of water quality. So you can design to a certain uh, reliability, 95% example, yeah, durability from a curve, how big the uh, maintenance flow must be in the river. But we have also other approaches in the Brantas and Bengawan Solo Basin here in Java that we consider the dilution power of the river in order to effectively dilute the pollution load 
as a consideration how to determine the discharge as an environmental flow in the river. I think that's that. We can discuss further. You have my email and I will be glad to explain further on. Buika. Okay, thank you very much, Ibuika, and also Mr. Raymond Valiant. And then I will go to the next question from Tan Fu. Please, Tan Fu. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a question to Dano. How are you? Okay. Uh, so, very thank, thank you for very nice uh, presentation. So, uh, I, I have a question about the possibility of uh, mud motor, uh, not sand motor like uh, that you did. Um, yes. Um, uh, well, there is, uh, as far as I know, only really one. Uh, uh, experiment going on at the moment. It's a little bit complicated. It's not bringing the mud directly to the place, uh, but some at, they're dumping it at the place where they're thinking that the, the mud uh, has, a, has a flow direction towards uh, the coast. This is in the Dutch Wadden Sea. Um, and this is an experiment that has been going on for a, a few years now. And I'm not sure if there's uh, really good evidence yet uh, how, much, how much it is doing. Um, but I, I think if you would uh, pipe the uh, significant amounts of mud really towards uh, the coast uh, in, in, in sufficient quantities like comparable to what, the, what they're dumping in the Porong River uh, out of the Lucy, uh, then, then I think you, you will absolutely uh, see mangroves uh, start to grow. I mean, we're not really sure how mangroves uh, protect uh, the coast and whether a certain thickness of mangroves actually guarantees that you get no erosion, but what we, have seen, and you've seen it with your own eyes in the Mekong Delta, is that if you have an area of big sedimentation, there's inevitably uh, going to be a lot of mangroves growing there. So uh, I think it should work, but I'm not, not aware of many real life big experiments with, uh, with mud motors. Yeah, thank you, Rano. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sanfu, I think from your name, I guess that you are Vietnamese, is it correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for participating in this webinar far away from Vietnam to Indonesia. Okay, and then I open for the next question is from Weedy, please. Um, thank you very much. I'm Weedy. Uh, my question for Paiko related with the uh, some explanation on uh, coastal protection that mostly provide in and not part of Jaffa. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is um, probably more focused to uh, non-urban area that probably uh, needs also some attention. And uh, what kind of a national plan for uh, at least uh, to protect non uh, urban area uh, against uh, tidal flooding, especially uh, especially in uh, agriculture area or salt harvesting area that uh, probably different uh, kind of, uh, they need different type of uh, protection because they need the uh, tidal uh, water uh, coming into the, the, the pond, but uh, mostly in, in, in uh, you mentioned the, the planning is mostly uh, like structural buildings and uh, dikes and something like that. Any uh, particular uh, protection for them or uh, probably they, they, we have already the, the, the national plan re regarding to that. Thank you. Yes, okay. Yeah, 
thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, basically, uh, in urban area near uh, near coastlines, it is sempadan area. Yeah, that is uh, this is declared by presidents or ministry. This is, is still needed to to protect the human and also the environment of the uh, in the in the near coastline. Yeah, so sempadan area is needed to apply. It. However, there is a situation, so maybe step by step, it can it can be uh, it can be it can be uh, it can be work, yeah, and it, it can be applied step by step because of the situation. I think this is sepatan area uh, still need uh, still needed for the to arrange the situation of coastline. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Mm, yeah. I think now we are close to the next question from uh, question link that the committee is already collected during a presentation. Okay. Once again, I think we still have, yeah, perhaps around uh, seven minutes to answer uh, some question from the audience. And the committee is already collect some question from the audience during a presentation through a Google form. I'm sorry, we are having some error here. Uh, I will try to read the next question from Putu Amarta Satwika Sukma from Institute Technology Bandung. The question is for Mr. Ramon. I am Putu Amarta, a civil engineering student at, at uh, ITB. I would like to ask a question about coastal protection, especially to the government and Republic of, of Indonesia. Massive abrasion had happened at many beaches or coastal area, especially in Bali. The government usually can't respond to the issue quickly due to budgeting, uh, bureaucracy, and so on. I think it is a great idea to develop local people to so they can involve in coastal protection or restoration while waiting the government advan advance restoration. What are the government's plan to educate or develop local people to involve in simple or professional coastal protection or restoration? How is the progress to prepare the people to overcome future issues for coastal protection? For Mr. Raymond, please. Uh, thank you for the kind question. To my understanding, Prof. Eko Winagrianto can answer that question more completely yeah. because uh, represent the government. But I agree very much that public participation is necessary. And I think that the government is trying to involve the people as well. Silakan, Prof. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, uh, the government is attention for the uh, coastal area problems, yeah, including the Bali. So that's why the in Bali also we built the laboratory modeling in Bali area in uh, Buleleng, yeah, in Buleleng. So uh, Bali uh, and, and also in uh, in our experience, the in Bali has been applied the model of the coastal protection in such like in the in the picture that I uh, that I. Uh, that we show in this presentation like that. So, of course, we uh, not only directly uh, apply the the, uh, the technology, but also we should check the situation and then 
how the technology uh, should apply it in the like uh, in Bali area because this is uh, there is a te geotechnical problem and also the geotechnical and also the uh, the hydraulic uh, wave yeah the hydraulic wave situation so this situation is very locally and needs the checks uh, the checks uh, comprehensively thank you very much yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Proveco. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe we go to the next question. I see I in the screen actually I there think is I a. Missed. Okay, there is a one question from. Indra Kurniawan, the Ministry of Public Works, question mm. to Prof. Roving. What is the dominant factor of coastal flood in the major city in the northern of Java Island, such as Jakarta? Is it the coastal erosion or the land subsidence combined by sea level rise? Prof. Daniel, question. Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't think at, at, in this case it is a coastal erosion because the coast is completely fixed. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's the, the, the port of Panjum Priok also. Um, so it's uh, mostly uh, the, uh, the, the land subsidence. Uh, of course, the, there's not major storm surges, some seasonal variations in the, in the water level and just the tidal variation. Uh, uh, and that leads to high water now and then. It's pretty predictable, um, but uh, yeah, as the as the the, the ground water, ground level is uh, is is going down, uh, the the flood uh, the flooding increases, uh, uh, the frequency increases. So that's the main uh, the main problem at the moment. And the flood defenses, of course, are not high enough, uh, or they they're also sinking. Uh, and uh, they're maybe even sinking harder than the land. So, uh, uh, so this is this is something to to look in, into uh, urgently. And also, when you have the sea level at a high point, then then the rivers cannot cannot discharge easily. Huh? So th th there's a backwater effect uh, that can can work quite a bit inland. Okay, I thank you very much, Prof. Dianu, for the answers. I have to the story. We already spent more than 30 minutes for a discussion session. And, and also, because time is so limited for these sessions, perhaps there are several questions that we cannot answer during this session. Professor Roving, Professor of Coastal Engineering and Port Development, IH Delft, Netherlands. And then Professor Eko Wiener Irianto and also Mr. Raymond. Is there anything else you would like to mention? Okay. Well, um, I, if people have, uh, have more questions than they've been able to, to answer here, then uh, uh, they can always uh, um, try to reach me. Uh, I think my email address is easy to be found at IHE Delft, and uh, and I'd be happy to 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 discuss further with uh, with uh, those who are interested. And I thank you for this opportunity to uh, give my views on the on the coastal management, uh, especially in Indonesia. And I hope that soon uh, the situation will improve so that we'll, I'll be able to visit once again uh, your beautiful country. Thank you very much. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, you, all of you have the questions, please uh, contact, contact me by email or maybe the others. And also, I will, if, if I can, uh, I can answer. Yeah, okay. I can directly answer. And also, if I not, uh, I cannot answer. I will forward to my team in the 
in my team in the Director General of Water Resources, mainly from my experts uh, for my college in Bali Technik Pantai in Bali. Okay, this is my uh, this is uh, my team in the expertise of uh, has the expertise of the uh, coastal protection. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Prabeko. Mr. Raymond? Uh, I think managing water, coastal lines, and any other related resources is a matter of connectivity. And I'm open also to answer any questions or any comments. Yeah, And feel free to create an environment where we can share knowledge through any media. My author must welcome. Okay, thank you very much for all speakers and thanks. Okay, uh, Prof. Eko Winar Irianto, and then Prof. Roving, and also Mr. Raymond Valians. Once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your sharings. And of course, to all our audience, thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope to see you again next time. Ms. Evie, time is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Bambang. Uh, for the questions that have not been answered yet today, we will send to the speakers and send it to you. Now we are about to take picture of the all participants in our Zoom meeting today for documentation. So please turn on your video and this will take several moments because we have some pages here. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation and attention. We would like to remind all the participants to fill the form for attendance to get the certificate of this webinar. The certificate will be provided within a couple of weeks. On behalf of the committee of this webinar and Water Resources Engineering Department, Universitas Brawijaya, we would like to thank all the speakers and participants for joining us today in this special event. We hope you have learned and enjoyed this presentation. Hopefully, this webinar will give you opportunity to expand your understanding and networks. And I also would like to thank the committee of this event on their efforts to make today's event run smoothly. And finally, thank you very much to all for your coming today. Good evening, everyone. Stay safe and stay healthy. See you again in the future webinar. Bye -bye. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We would like to thank you to Mr. Ramon, to Professor Janu Rolfing, and also to Professor Eko for coming today and give up, um, give up, uh, and give some lectures today to all of us. Thank you very much for all who attend today's meeting. Thank you, Pak Ramon. Thank you, Pak Janu. And thank you, Prof. Echo. Makasih, Bu. Sudah ditugaskan. Terima kasih, Pak Ramon. Thank you very much for your coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Danu. Thank you very much for your sharing today, Prof. Danu. It's very nice presentation. I hope that in the future we can make some collaboration. Thank you very much. 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 Alice. We will close this Zoom meeting right now. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, Prof. Dano. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. See you. See you. See you next program. Thank you, Prof. Bye-bye.